Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Today I am with Melissa Chin of Spectator USA. Uh, I've had her on the podcast before. Today we are going to talk about the threat of China, how how we got here to the place to where China has influenced our culture, influenced our media, influenced the way we think in our economics and our technological development so much and how we can possibly get out of their influence, which as you will learn through this conversation, is so important. And so she's got a lot of insight to give us on this. I'm excited for you to hear it. Without further ado, here is Melissa Chen. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell everyone who you are and what you do? Okay, my name is Melissa Chen, and um, I'm the New York editor of Spectator USA. Um, I'm also the managing director of an organization called Ideas Beyond Borders. And what we do is we translate books into Arabic, digitize them, and make them available for free. Wow. And you talk a lot about, well, you talk about a lot of different subjects and uh, you're a really great follow for that reason. Um, One area that I want to focus on today is China, our relationship with China, kind of in general, and also specifically how you foresee the Biden administration kind of dealing with this hostile regime. Uh, First, can you kind of tell us your expertise in this area? So, you know, when it comes to China, I think, firstly, I grew up in, in a authoritarian country by most measures. Um, Singapore doesn't really have that many political freedoms, and it is a majority Chinese country, um, one of the biggest one, ones, at least in terms of percentage of Chinese um, in terms of the population. Mm-hmm. So I think I kind of understood growing up a little bit about what it's like when when you have, um, you know, policies or government policies that are repressive, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to political freedoms. Mm-hmm. Um, Singapore got it right on, I guess, uh, economic freedoms. It's a very easy to do business kind of country. Um, people love living there. They raise good kids there. Um, I came to the United States when I was about 17. I immigrated here for college and I love the values of the United States, um, especially the First Amendment. So I was pretty disappointed when I started seeing in college, maybe about like when I was in grad school about 2015, how the country was changing. And it reminded me of what it's like being back home in Singapore, where there were certain, you know, kind of avenues of speech where you weren't allowed to discuss. Mm. And, you know, kind of being Chinese, I knew also how, how important Confucian values were to shaping society. And I felt, okay, this is a topic that I need to be a little bit more vocal about. Because I don't think the American, uh, at least back then, the Americans weren't really like, we, we weren't talking about this issue. Right. And it can, was very. And can you expound just for people who don't know Confucian values, what you mean by that? Um, it's, it's, so Confucius was a philosopher whose philosophy really underpins a lot of Chinese culture. Mm. Um, it's very much focused on hierarchy, of, on duty, um, and, and it's, um, it's a very it's it's focuses also on a lot of discipline. Mm. It values discipline, and of the group over the individual. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. And so um, these were very important to um, to society and to the principles that were in Singapore, in in China, yeah. and you kind of saw that infiltrating in American institutions, and that that disturbed you. Well, it's um, more likely that. You know, there were certain aspects of culture that was very was increasingly getting very repressive. Um, we were justifying actions by sort of this idea about social harmony. Mm. Um, and you know, about when I was in school at the time, it wasn't that bad. But I continued to work in a very academic environment, and I saw that on campus you had students that were clamoring for repression of speech. These were you know, the people that were going to graduate and go into our newsrooms, go into tech companies, HR departments everywhere. And, and they had this idea that that speech needed to be clamped down upon. Right. It, it was equivalent to violence somehow. And so that was very disturbing to me because I, I saw what that does to, you know, how that chills culture, basically. Mm-hmm. And how do you think that happened? I mean, uh, we had this dream, Ronald Reagan, who I really like and admire, he had a vision in the 80s and even when he wrote in the 90s that if we kind of exported capitalism into China, that they would become this freedom-loving 
society and they would become maybe even more like the United States. Well, that didn't really happen. They took on capitalism and they kind of exported communism and more totalitarian ideas into places like the United States to where, like you said, We've kind of become familiar with and comfortable with, some people have, especially in academia, the repression of speech and the repression of so-called dangerous ideas. How, how do you think we allowed that to happen over the past few decades? So I think it really began, you know, with um, Milton Friedman. His idea was that political freedoms were a necessary condition to lead to ec uh, economic freedom was necessary to lead to political freedoms. And this was consensus, not just in economics, but also in terms of politics and our foreign policy for, I don't know, ever since Richard Nixon went to China. This idea that, you know, if we just trade it with China, if we just engage with them economically, um, that automatically, just by default, the Ch Chinese would clamor for more freedoms right. and they would want political rights. Um, and then we also thought, I think that's another, uh, uh, you know, in terms of hubris, um, is that we thought that if China got the internet, um, Bill Clinton famously said, China censoring the internet is going to be like kneeling jello to the wall. He actually said this. And he kind of laughed, and so did the audience. And of course, <laughs> you know, fast forward later, it's, it's obvious now that they did actually figure out how to nail jello to the wall. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese internet is completely censored and, and walled off. They built this great firewall. And so if you were right now, you know, growing up in Beijing and you launched your web browser, it looks very different. You can't go to Wikipedia. You can't go to Google, Twitter, any of these, you know, social media platforms that you and I can, can just, you know, load up and just like talk to people that have dissenting views or even just read articles from, from different sources like the New York Times itself. Um, and so you can see that, you know, this, this calculation was, was one of the biggest foreign policy mistakes I think the United States made since about 1930. Um, and, but there was good reason to think that China would open up. I don't think that that was a bad calculation. But I think we missed a lot of signs along the way that it wasn't going as planned. And many of our elites were very happy to reap the economic benefits from that trade. A lot of our jobs were shipped overseas and, you know, middle class was hollowed out. Um, and and so here we are with an economically empowered China and they are as authoritarian as ever. They've mm -hmm. figured out how to fuse capitalism with authoritarianism. And in a very new way, they call this socialism with Chinese characteristics. Mm. You know, something that disturbs me is... Um, the softness and even strange affection that a lot of the elites seem to have, and not just the elites because of the economic benefits that we have been able to reap, like you said, getting cheap products that aren't made in the United States. But also I think that there is a section of progressivism that is actually okay with China or doesn't want to criticize China, maybe for a variety of reasons. I think one of them is the intersectional reason that we have to just focus on America being bad, the Western world being bad, whiteness being bad, and we can't possibly criticize the Chinese regime because in the world of critical race theory, we have to see everyone that's non-Western and non-white as um uh, part of the oppressed class. I think that's blinding a lot of people to the brutal reality of the regime and, and what people are suffering under the CCP. Would you agree? I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I've said often that, that, you know, woke ideology, which encompasses critical race and intersectionality, um, has made it very difficult to view certain global events, right? So right. one of the articles I wrote was about Hong Kong because you had the people of Hong Kong, you know, protesting. One in seven Hong Kongers were out on the streets protesting and, and clamoring for democracy. And, you know, they were pushing back against China. And, you know, it was very, they were waving, for example, the Union Jack. They were singing the Star Spangled Banner. They were waving the American flag. Mm. And, and you know, uh, people that kind of, view the world through critical race are looking at this and saying, how can a former, you know, colony, British colony be raising the flag of their, of their former colonial master? Right. It didn't compute, like, because, you know, in, in terms of this ideology, you should be wanting to decolonize everything. And they don't, they, it's very difficult for people to see that, okay, maybe certain ideas like freedom and democracy are something that is, you know, that comes from the West and that people 
in some countries may actually want something like that. And it almost ca- causes this like era 404 doesn't compute. Yeah. Um, and and so I, I wrote a piece about this talking about how it's so limiting to look at global issues like that. And in fact, these issues should challenge this view that should, mm-hmm. should really challenge this view that, you know, just because um, a country is or a culture is not white um, doesn't mean that that, you know, they, they can't uh, that, that you can't criticize it or right. that, you know, they, they can be flawed. I mean, China is not is being imperialistic. They're imposing, you know, in people that really don't like imperialism should be fighting China because right. they are imposing a Chinese way of life onto many regions right now. So it's not just Hong Kong. They're also doing it in Xinjiang, for example, which yeah. is where the Uyghur Muslims are living. Yeah. Oh, there are so many questions that I want to ask you based on that. One thing that I was thinking about, the way that I think intersectionalists and some people on the left did try to fit what was happening in Hong Kong into their very myopic worldview was to say, well, actually, uh, what the people in Hong Kong are resisting it's the same thing as what, you know, people in Portland and Seattle are doing. They try to compare, oh you know, the Black Lives Matter and Tifa rioters to the demonstrators in Hong Kong. Can you talk about why that's just not a good comparison? I would say they're the opposite, but what would you they're say? They're the total opposite. I mean, firstly, that is actually a Chinese Communist Party line. Mm-hmm. Um, they very much love it when people conflate the two. Um, and in fact, they were eager to to blast that kind of meme and, and message mm. um, that linking the Hong Kong protesters to what Antifa was doing, um, especially when Antifa was going after federal buildings and and the Hong Kong protesters were occupying the Legislative Council. Now, obviously, the premise of both um, kinds of unrest is uh, very different. Um, in the United States, we are a democracy. You can actually elect your leaders. And so you have these instruments of democracy that you can use to affect change. I mean, we just changed our president. Is that not proof enough that we live in a world where, where you know, you can actually exercise nonviolent or non-civil unrest kind of means to affect change? Now in Hong Kong, they don't even have a chance to elect their leaders. They were protesting a broad and very sweeping national security law that would allow anybody with seditious thoughts to essentially be arrested, mm. um, you know, jailed in, in China. And, and we all know also that the chi- Chinese legal system is, is basically a kangaroo court. Um, it's, it's not transparent. There's no separation of powers um, in the Chinese government, unlike in the U.S. government, where executive and judicial and legislative are, are separated. In China, they are all fused and, and you have no recourse once you're arrested. So mm-hmm. they were really fighting for, for their lives in a way, in a very real way. Real way. It's, it was about freedom. And, you know, in Portland, they, they could just not elect the mayor if they didn't like what the mayor was doing. You know, why were they burning buildings? It, it just didn't yeah. make sense at all. And doing so in a lot of cases with almost total impunity and not just that, but also approval in some cases by the powers that be, or at least just kind of um, looking nodding to this, along, nodding yeah, they along, were nodding along. Yeah. right. Or not naming, um, not naming the, the group's, specifically and just saying, you know, we're against violence, but we won't actually say who is doing the violence. Now, some people listening might not actually know what happened in Hong Kong. And I want to use this as a kind of transition into the um, the oppression that the CCP is uh, is exacting over its people. Um, But first, can you talk about why why Hong Kongers were dissenting? Why were they demonstrating? What happened to the formerly British colony? So there was a treaty um, that basically guaranteed Hong Kong after the British hand, uh, the British actually handed over the territory to China um, in 1997. There was a treaty that would guarantee Hong Kong to be autonomous for at least the next 50 years, so till uh, 2047. Um, China, you know, was was very happy to actually let Hong Kong exist under this one country, two systems. So officially, this is China, but Hong Kong retains 
the you know the institutions and and the the sort of more democratic uh, institutions that remain that was a vestige from from the British colonial past. Um, and also in terms of culture, Hong Kong was, you know, for, for a good part of like the 80s and 90s, I mean, you probably, I mean, you were probably too young, but, but there were, uh, it was, it was kind of the center, the cultural center of Asia. Movies were produced there. It was a center for publishing because it had this climate that was completely, that was very free um, in terms of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. So, you know, in, instead of allowing this uh, to, to go on, this one country, two systems model, um, the Chinese Communist Party reneged on its treaty, essentially. Um, they started clamoring down on Hong Kong, slowly stripping Hong Kong one by one of, of their freedoms and autonomy that was guaranteed by the treaty. Um, so the, the thing that kind of, so the protests, pro-democracy protests have actually been going on since 2014. Um, and again, this is because of the you know little things that have been chipping away at the freedoms one by one. But the thing that really set everything off last year uh, or the year before was actually this extradition law. China basically imposed uh, an extradition law into Hong Kong, saying that um, anyone that's found you know guilty of uh, whatever sedition or whatever crime uh, can be extradited uh, back to the mainland for for trial. And this was very alarming to a lot of activists, um, to a lot of artists, people that are critical of, of the Chinese government and want to retain their right to criticize even just policies of, of the Chinese government, which, which really should be up for criticism. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then they blanketed, you know, this new this security law that was even more sweeping, broadened the definition of what sedition was, what incitement was, um, and they started um, arresting people that were in the sort of democracy, the opposition parties in Hong Kong. So they just completely overreached. Um, and and that's why people were, were so angry and they were on the streets. They wanted to fight for their you know, own right to vote in the parties. They wanted to fight to abolish the, the security law. And they wanted the world to notice and to stand with them. Um, and yeah, that's what the Hong Kong protests were really about. And did the world stand with them? I mean, I know there were conservative Americans and probably progressive Americans, too, who who did, at least in our voices. But I mean, what about the U.N.? What about other world powers? Did anyone come to their aid? Um, not so much. The global institutions were, were pretty quiet on. I mean, I think you did have like Human Rights Watch definitely released statements. Um, but in terms of actual policy, right, I think the UK and, and the US was thinking about this, but the UK definitely um, opened the country up and saying that, okay, if you ha- have a Hong Kong passport, you're going to have a pathway to citizenship. You're allowed to, to you know, travel to, to the UK and at least yeah. uh, try to, to immigrate. Um, but for the most part, I mean, look at what happened when we had a sitting manager of an NBA team basically espouse his support for for you know the Hong Kongers who are fighting for their freedoms. Look what happened to him. He well, he doesn't even manage that team anymore. But yeah. he was completely you know he he was he had to grovel and apologize for for what was a very benign um, right. statement of support on Twitter. Wow, that's. Can you talk about just in case people just don't know or they just don't fully understand the depths of evil of the CCP? Um, And we're talking not just internationally, but with their own people. Can you talk about some of the things that they're doing, for example, like with the Uyghur Muslims? Yeah, um, my gosh, the this is one of those cases that is just so tragic because it's happening right right in front of our eyes. Um, The Uyghur population is, is basically a Turkic um, Muslim minority that lives in northwestern China in a region called Xinjiang. And um, they have been sort of surveilled. Um, their freedoms have been curtailed. They're, you know, some some Uyghur Muslims are actually put into these modern day re-education camps that look very reminiscent of of, you know, camps past in Auschwitz and you know they they don't have any um there's no due process so if you got if you got swept up by the state security apparatus you basically get whisked away um your family never knows when they'll see you again and Mm -hmm. all in the name of you know fighting extremism fighting terrorism um and separatism Mm -hmm. because 
you know, the Chinese government ultimately is worried that that this minority group wants to to separate and be autonomous from China, and that is no go for the Chinese government. And so, based on you know just their characteristics, now they're actually using genetic data as well to identify who is Uyghur. Um, right. They are they are imprisoning them up front. So, you know, with, with just nothing other than, no information other than um, just what, who they are and, and what they believe. And so they're also trying to um, sinicize their habits. They force these Muslims to basically shave their beards. They can't eat pork. And when they get, when they get sent to these re-education camps, they have to sing praises of the Chinese Communist Party. They have to sing these patriotic songs. It's, you know, make pledges. It's kind of, it's very, very creepy Mm -hmm. um, because it's so totalitarian in terms of how they're subjugating these people. And, um, you know, satellite images, some some reporters have done amazing work. One of the things about China is that journalists, especially foreign journalists, don't have freedom of movement in the country. So if you're a foreign journalist and you try to go to Xinjiang to even have eyes on the ground and report on this, you will probably not be allowed to, um, you know, actually last year during COVID, China kicked out the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, all these Beijing bureaus that were there. So we don't even have offices in China anymore. They're not allowed to operate there. And um, and, and journalists have been expelled for, for just their honest reporting on what was going on in Xinjiang. Um, so it's, it's and you know, they're also doing a forced sterilization mm-hmm. of, of um, the Uyghur Muslim women. And, and recently, Pompeo, Secretary Pompeo actually, you know, designated what was happening there as a genocide. Mm-hmm. And um, actually, to Biden's Secretary of State's credit, Antony Blinken, he actually agreed that it was yeah. a genocide. Yeah, forced yeah. sterilizations is what I've seen reported, forced abortions, and just some of the testimonies of women that have actually been able to speak who have somehow escaped or who have just been able to um, give testimony to what's happened. What's happened really for a lot longer than I think the United States has known um, are these forced late-term abortions. And there was this propaganda tweet that went up not too long ago as we're recording this that said, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is, um, they're doing such wonders and such favors for the Uyghur Muslim people to make sure that these women, um, you know, they're modern. Modernized, and they're um, they're not forced to have you know eight children. We are being so kind um, by performing these forced abortions and forced sterilization, um, uh, forced sterilization procedures. We're basically liberating women because of that. I'm not sure that people understand the willingness and um, the brazenness of the Chinese Communist Party to just flat out lie about everything. Right. And it's it, it right. really amazes me how we're not more angry at China, not just for that, but how they've lied about the coronavirus, how they've infiltrated the WHO with their lies. I don't know. I don't know if it's naivete by Americans or if it's just apathy or if it's that critical race theory coming in, but it really blows my mind. I, I think coronavirus has woken a lot of Americans up to uh, China's actions because, um, you know, how they dealt with COVID, how they've tried to spin the narrative after they got caught out for um, basically letting this spread um, and not alerting the world about it. And, you know, just kind of hampering the the WHO investigations that one year later, <laughs> more than a year later, finally a team made it there. And even though a team made it there, they were not allowed to um, examine one hypothesis that seems, you know, not at all to be ruled out, which is the lab leak hypothesis. And so you can see that, you know, China is really trying to control this narrative. And um, I I think the American people also have woken up because of that realization in the few months after COVID really, like lockdowns kind of happened. China was hoovering up the world's supply of PPE. um, And then, you know, it, it kind of became pretty apparent that a lot of our supply chains were located inside a geopolitical adversary. And, and that became a bit of a shock because, well, what happens when you need to be militarily ready um, and all your supply chains are there? So I think in the last year, the public opinion has actually kind of shifted on China. And Gallup showed that, like, I think 80% of Americans now view the country unfavorably. 
Um, so I think we're in a, you know, we're in a situation where there is bipartisan consensus that China cannot be seen anymore as just a competitor. It is a geopolitical rival. It is a threat. And, and you know, we have to see it more in that context. Okay, guys, summer is my favorite season and 4th of July is my favorite holiday. Can I even call it a holiday? I know it's kind of people think that it's scandalous to say that I like 4th of July more than I like Christmas. It's not because of what it represents. I just love the 4th of July and I love summer. And one of the reasons why I love summer is because I love grilling out. I love being outside. I love barbecue. I love all of that good stuff. And I really love high quality beef and chicken. And that is why my husband and I love good ranch. They ship you to your doorstep organic from American farms, beef and chicken. You can even get your chicken pre-marinated if you want. It's ready to put on the grill as soon as it comes to your door. It's fresh. And like I said, my favorite thing about it is that we're supporting American farmers. The vast majority of beef that you're buying in American grocery stores is not actually from America. And this is a wonderful company. They're out of Texas. They're just a great family that owns Good Ranchers that you really they're the kind of family that you really want to support. So if you're like me, you love the 4th of July, you love grilling season, you love summer, it's my favorite season, and you're looking for high quality meat and you want to support American farmers and you're looking for an affordable, easy easy option, then you need to go to goodranchers.com. It really is the best option for you to get high quality meat. Go to goodranchers.com slash Allie and you'll get $20 off. That's goodranchers.com slash Allie for $20 off. That's goodranchers.com slash Allie. And I think a lot of people also don't know, even though I am glad to hear that the majority of the country do see China, uh, does see China rightly, um, what they're doing in Africa, what they're doing in South America, you know, catching these poor countries in debt traps by saying, you know, we're going to create these railways or something like in Ethiopia, and you'll be able to pay us back with all the money that you're making. The railways don't work, the construction doesn't end, or whatever it is. Um, the, these things don't function that they build in these countries, and then they've caught these countries in a debt trap. Or I have a friend who is from Zimbabwe, and um, they're... Uh, there are places in Zimbabwe where you can um, you can get oil, you can dig for oil. Um, and rather than the people in Zimbabwe being able to do that themselves, the Zimbabwean government has said, no, we're going to reserve this area for China. Um, and so I think people also don't realize just how, like you said, imperialistic and mm-hmm. colonizing this regime is. And it's just interesting that people who are against imperialism and colonization um, they tend to not have quite as much to say when the Chinese government does it. Exactly. And actually, it's even more insidious than that, because when these countries cannot pay up for this debt, like this actually happened in Sri Lanka, they have to give up their ports. They have to give up strategic wow. assets to China that's part of the contract. And then that becomes a way China <sighs> is basically controlling important entry points that are strategic in an event of some sort of military operation, for example. and so. This is, it's, it's, it's very dangerous. Yeah, it is. And obviously China going into these agreements knows how it's going to end. It concludes exactly how they want it to conclude. They know that these poor countries are not going to be able to pay them back. I don't even think we understand um, the, the depths of evil and oppression, unfortunately, that they are executing, um, not just on their own people, but around the world. One thing that I do want to talk to you about that we talked about before we started recording was other kinds of religious persecution in China, not just towards the Uyghur Muslims, but also towards Christians. And in particular, this rewriting um, of the Bible to fit more communistic standards. Can you talk about that? Um, Yeah. So actually, this was published in the National Review last year, and uh, it it came to the attention of, of the author um, that there was, in fact, a, a rewrite of, of the Christian Bible. So, you know, in the last few years, Christianity has been really um, suppressed in China. So, you know, church cro- uh, crosses have been torn down from churches. Pastors have been arrested. 
for no reason. Um, and and the Xi Jinping himself uh, has been reported to be afraid of, of the rising influence of Christianity in China. I think the projection is that by 2030, China, China will have more Christians in the country than anywhere around, else around the world. Um, and the thing about the communist country is that they they're very afraid of of religion kind of supplanting the state mm -hmm. and so that's why they keep religion under it under such a strong thumb mm -hmm. and it's not just christianity obviously it's the buddhists i mean ask the tibetans they've been subjugated for a long time uh falun gong which is also a taoist blend and buddhist blend of of um you know this a spiritual group uh they who they've been subjected reportedly to um, organ har harvesting, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in the case of Christian Christianity in particular, it's it's a big threat because there's just so many. It's 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 a lot in terms of numbers. Um, the Catholics on 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 one hand have a bit of a easier time, and that's because I think two years ago the Pope actually you know agreed to let China be the one that oversees the appointing of the bishops. But, you know, Christianity tends to be, Protestantism at least, is, is more decentralized. And so it's been targeted uh, a bit more heavily by, 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 the, by the CCP. Mm -hmm. um, and so this rewrite of the Bible was actually really, it, it's so creepy. Um, it was actually a story, one, of the, one, of the, one example of the rewrite um, is actually the story in, I think it was in the Gospel of John where there was an adulteress and, and he, the adulteress was about to be stoned. And Jesus tells the crowd, you know, let, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, um, pointing out to, you know, to the crowd about hypocrisy and about the importance of forgiveness. Eventually the crowd disperses and the woman, you know, doesn't get stoned. In the Chinese Communist Party rewrites of the Bible, this section, um, Jesus Christ lets the crowd disperse. but he takes a, a rock and he actually bashes the woman's head. What? So he kills her himself. Um, and if you, you know, the reasoning for, for this kind of a rewrite is the moral that the story tells that is in line with oh, advancing the wow. CCP's goal. And the CCP's goal is to say that the law of the land cannot be subverted. Um, that religion, Jesus Christ, this religious figure, had to conform to the law of the land because the law is the law. And it is so disturbing. Um, wow. Yeah, you can look it up. National Review did a really good uh, write up about about this the CCP version of the Bible. Yeah, um, that's the kind of you know it, it tells you so much too about what the country fears. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think it's a very stark reminder of of the kind of uh, you know lengths at which they're willing to go to to either supplant, co opt, or repress religion. Yes, and uh, you talked about this so well and so thoroughly that the real enemy, I think, it seems that China sees is an ideological enemy. It's not just a military enemy. It's not just about technology, but it's primarily ideology. And to me, that I mean, that seems to be their motivation for infiltrating so many institutions in the United States and for so effectively putting um, or pushing their propaganda in the United States that unfortunately we see a lot of people repeating without even really realizing it. And certainly as a Protestant Christian myself, I can see why the CCP would see Protestants as a threat. If you look at the history of, Protest of Protestantism, it has been resistance to tyranny. The the America probably would not have been founded without the Protestant Reformation. The ideas of the Constitution and the Declar Declaration of Independence are are built on that. Um, and so I I can see why. I can see why they, they see it as a threat. And I think Christians here should be uh, more aware of what they are trying to do on an ideological value system level, even more than we are looking at what they're actually doing militarily or what they're doing with our technology. Um, and just yeah. kind of be aware of the perversion that they're trying to be able to push on our faith in the name of kind of claiming minds and claiming belief systems. Um, do you think, or do you have hope, I guess, for how the United States is going to confront the threat of China here and abroad under the Biden administration? 
You know, I, I think what you said about the ideology part is actually spot on. It's something that I think I've been trying to get people to understand that that's actually, you know, they always say culture is downstream of politics. Well, ideology is downstream of culture. Mm-hmm. And if we don't get that piece right, we're, you know, and think that we're still in the position where, where China can be engaged with um, and, and, you know, we can use, I don't know, we, to, to get concessions, to get them to cooperate on, say, climate change, we're going to concede and appease. Um, you know, it's been demonstrated for the last dec- last few decades that, that that kind of engagement, appeasement tactic just hasn't worked at all. And, and that's also because that, we, you know, we didn't really focus on ideological differences between China and the United States and how those ideological differences actually clash. And so if you have room for only one kind of world order, um, which I think that's what the case is that we're looking at here because they're antagonistic um, in the sense that they're mutually exclusive. Like if the American world order is going to be the predominant one, the Chinese one cannot be at the same time, mm-hmm. um, then then we really have to push back on what's happening on every front. And, you know, you spoke about the influence operations of infiltrating these institutions. Um, we're talking about on the economic front, um, you know, the theft, corporate espionage, intellectual property theft, um, then the digital front, we're looking at AI, we're looking at um, sort of big tech issues, um, 5G, for example. And, um, and then you have in, uh, more like covert influence, influence operations like the Confucius Institutes, um, you know, kind of cultural exchange kind of uh, institutions here. And, um, and things like the Belt and Road, which is really the Belt and Road Initiative, the debt trap diplomacy is... Mm-hmm an attempt to to influence um, other countries and and sort of buy their acquiescence, right? Mm-hmm. Um, things like the Thousand Talents Program, which, you know, China uses to recruit American um, academics to set up shop in China and, and, and sort of share their research. Research that, by the way, like the American taxpayers are funding. Wow. So essentially you are funding you know, they're the development of China's um, technologies. Um, so it's it's been happening on all these fronts. Mm-hmm. And and I think I think the knowledge, firstly, like that this is happening has only really started to percolate upwards in the last year or so to the American public. More and more cases, the DOJ has launched this thing called the China Initiative. Um, and the DOJ has been like prosecuting more cases. I think the FBI said that they open um, out of every, out of out of the the cases that are currently open in terms of uh, counterintelligence cases. About fifty percent are against uh, Chinese nationals or people that are spying yeah. on behalf of of the Chinese government. So there is growing awareness. Now the question is, how are we going to push back, right? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, we want to avoid a hot war at all costs. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the primary way is we're going to finally have to impose costs on China for very bad behavior. We, we need to dis- disincentivize um, the kind of behavior that that really we've let China just run away with for the longest time. Yeah. That has there has just never they've not faced any costs yeah. for the things that are you know for unleashing the coronavirus for example they have not faced any costs for reneging on the treaty with uh, uh, Britain on Hong Kong. So we need to ramp all these uh, costs up, and that's in part what Trump's trade tariffs was supposed to do was to punish them for you know for basically taking advantage of the United States in terms of uh, trade for the longest time and having this like huge imbalance in our trade deficit. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the kind of action that we need to do for every action that the Chinese government has been um, taking a little inch on, you know, militarizing the South China Sea. We need to push back. We need to impose a cost on them for doing that so they know that this is just unacceptable. Okay, so I've told you guys before that I am a sucker for convenience. Anything that makes my life easier or more efficient, I really like. And that's why I like fastgrowingtrees.com. It's the world's 
largest online nursery. So if you are interested in planting fruit trees or trees for shade, or if you've just got a little porch and you want some, you want some plants on your porch that don't need a whole lot of sun, then fastgrowingtrees.com is the place for you. You can look through their wide variety of trees and plants. Like I said, fruit trees are just trees for shade. And they also are an amazing resource if you just need advice. If you want to know uh, what kind of vegetation you can plant in your area or in your kind of backyard or on your porch and what kind of sunlight and what kind of shade they need, then Fast Growing Trees is really great for you. And this just makes it easier because you don't actually have to go out to the nursery and pick the tree. It's super hot right now. And so if you just want to stay in the convenience of your home and not have to, you know, get your car messy and all that comes with trying to get you know, plants and trees into your car and then transport them home, go to fastgrowingtrees.com. You can go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash Allie for 15% off now through July 31st. That's 15% off your order at fastgrowingtrees.com slash Allie. That's fastgrowingtrees.com slash Allie. I think... Uh, part of our responsibility here is to connect the dots for people that um, if this truly is primarily an ideological battle um, and they are pushing forward on that front, and like you said so well, that the American world order and the Chinese world order are mutually exclusive. If the Chinese world order is the dominant one, then this idea of equality and inherent rights and free speech and religious liberty, those are all gone. Those are not values that China has. And and China has uh, has has no priority, no desire whatsoever to say, okay, well, once we are officially in charge of everything and everyone, we'll still allow you to have some of your value systems. We'll still allow you to have some of your belief systems. They're not interested in that. They're interested in world domination. The way that America kind of affectionately and maybe naively said, you know what, we're going to kind of give some of our values to China and hope for the best for their people. The feeling is not mutual there. (laughs) Like they don't have any sort of compassion or generosity or understanding towards other ways of life in other kinds of cultures and other kinds of people or belief systems or other ideas of rights. They just won't allow it. Right. And and how they are treating their, you know, internally their people domestically is a very good harbinger of of how they're going to act when or if they they have control of a wider swath of the world population. Yeah. And so it really behooves us to take that as as a sign and and act on principle rather than you know, let them fester. And and by the way, they're going to be, they're actually perfecting this techno surveillance state, um, the panopticon, they're perfecting that on the Uyghurs. And you know, they're going to deploy it on a, on a much larger scale. Of I mean, course. they already have this rudimentary, actually, it's not even rudimentary, it's pretty sophisticated um, social credit system that the entire country is subject to. Um, they've co-opted technology and digital technology and, and all encompassing kind of um, apps that you know, determine whether or not you can buy a ticket to travel, whether or not you can make a doctor's appointment. I mean, essentially what they're going for all the way, like, you know, from denying political rights, denying speech, it's it's really even thought control. Mm-hmm. Because once you have a social credit system set up, you can essentially just control what people think by by, you know, imposing costs yeah. um, in terms of participation in society, which, yeah. which you know, is necessary for life. Yeah. So it's, it's very disturbing because if they're successful at this and they gain more influence and they do become a world power, um, there's almost no question that that's, that's really yeah. going to be the world that we live in. And Americans, I think, for the most part, we almost can't understand that because our limiting principles are different. We think, okay, at some point... Um, Everyone has the same basic understanding of evil, the same basic understanding of right and wrong. Everyone knows when too far is too far, but that's, it's just not true. It's just not true. They don't have any kind of limiting principle. You can bet that if there is some kind of development that actually allows real mind control, if there is actually a technological advancement that allows that, China's not going to think, you know, that's too far. The brain is a frontier that we just, we're just not going to allow because we want people to have freedom of thought. That kind of idea is just, it, 
it's it's not accepted by the CCP. I think one thing, and I know we've got to wrap up, but one thing that I just see us damaging or see damaging us so much here and weakening us so much is the kind of curriculum that we are teaching our kids and teaching in academia mm. that that encourages a hatred and a resentment and a loathing of the United States so that people think, well, we're no better than the CCP. Why Why should right. we fight for our principles? Why should we care about the Constitution or inherent rights? All of these things are systemically racist. They're oppressive. They're wrong. And America is just as bad as any evil regime, even worse. That kind of idea, I don't know if it's directly from the CCP, but the CCP loves it. That's exactly they benefit from it. Yes, they that's exactly what they want us to think. I just I see that as almost the biggest domestic threat that we have. That if you have people that hate themselves, hate their fellow countrymen, hate their country and their founding principles, why why would anyone stand up against the totalitarian values of you know a regime like the CCP? Right. No, you're, you're exactly right. So um, do you have any kind of encouragement for people or any just final advice in our everyday lives, um, how we can make ourselves aware of what's going on, how we can kind of push back against some of the threats that we're seeing? Most people listening probably aren't, aren't part of the FBI um, and they don't have that kind of access. Is there anything that we can do in our own lives practically? Yeah, I think, um, for example, you know, being aware of of products, I think you know, made in China, for example, it's so difficult to to actually so boycott hard. something like that. Everything yeah. is made in China, um, but but more awareness about what is, what isn't, you know, I think decoupling as far as possible will go a long way because it will allow us to respond in a way that that is based on principle, and also pressure companies that are, you know, basically trading in principle and ethics for market access. So, you know, you're looking at media companies, your your Hollywood companies um, that are rewriting scripts to, to tailor to the Chinese uh, Communist Party's narratives. They don't want any reference to Tibet, for example. And so, you know, they change characters that are Tibetan monks in their in their movie scripts. Um, you know, be aware of of what institutions uh, the Chinese government has infiltrated. You know, watch out for that. Boycott that personally. Um, and, and, you know, if you have a representative, a local representative, you know, write to them and make sure that they're aware of, of such issues and, and that, you know, Chinese investment, for example, should be viewed very skeptically. Um, so I would say that's probably the, the best thing we can do and, and just keep, you know, keep reading the news about this stuff. It's, it's very important because this is going to define the next, the next century. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And where can they where can they follow you and how can they read all of your stuff and all of your insight into what's going on in China? Um you so my beat is China that that's kind of what I focus on writing for Spectator USA so you can find it on on the Spectator USA website. Um but also you can just follow me on Twitter. It's um at sign miss m s mel m e l chen c h e n. Awesome. Well, thank you so much Melissa for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for talking about such an important thing. I'm really glad that more, you know, more people are really trying to to, to air air all this stuff out and and Definitely. inform the American people. Definitely. Well, thank you.